get somewhat on time going. Looks like we have a good crowd. Thanks for sticking around. We, of course, all know that standing between this panel and you guys for dinner is not always a good thing to have, but I don't ho see any riots happening, I hope, even though barricades of 48 should be inspiring, right? Uh, unfortunately, we only have two presenters present today. One of them, unfortunately, is out for injury reasons, as far as I know, and I will be reading her paper in the middle between the two. And we'll be starting today with Edith Robbins. She comes to us from Grand Isle, Nebraska, a very 1848-influenced town. She had worked at the um, Stuhr Museum in Grand Isle as a research associate for a while. She also has presented at a number of conferences, including the Society of German-American Studies and the regional conferences in Missouri Valley Historical Conference in Omaha. Works include, for example, Marching with the First Nebraska, a diary she co-edited of a German immigrant. And she has done a lot of work with newspapers, which is kind of nice, since she is also working and presenting to us today about Friedrich Heide, who has done some work with newspapers in the past. And her paper is entitled, Fred Heide, Immigration Agent for the State of Nebraska. It is. This is here. Uh, okay, this is a painting I uh, found in Germany, and I think it's very charming. It shows a sailboat, and it shows a family who is about to debark for the United States. And uh, I always thought that this painting is not very well known in America, but I just heard today it is quite well known in Germany, so it has been published before. This is uh, nothing new. Well, uh, Dr. Repmann Yogi has in so many publications introduced us to Friedrich Hedde in his time in Germany as a participant in the 48 revolution and in uh, his immigration to the United States. The article on the trial of the school teacher Markus Meister by Hans Peter Müller on the article on Hedda's life in Davenport by William Rober. Also, I found out that Scott Christensen has written a biography on him, gives us further information of this remarkable man. Therefore, I will just shortly touch on Hedda's earlier life before I talk about his work as an immigration agent. Works. I'm innocent about these things, I don't know. Uh, this is a photo of Fred Hedde, uh, his time of the revolution about. Uh, Friedrich August Peter Hedde was born in September of 1818 in Rendsburg. He studied jurisprudence in Kiel, is a founder of the first Tonverein in Schleswig-Holstein, editor with Theodor Olshausen of the Kieler Korrespondenzblatt and later sole editor. He becomes a member of the Schleswig-Holstein Ständeversammlung and is considered one of the sharpest supporters of the working class. But his political position in the Ständeversammlung and his friendship with Olshausen earns him some critique from Karl Marx. In 1851, in a trial, he defends successfully Marcus Meister, the leader of the Holsteinische Landarbeiterbewegung, who had been accused of communistische Aufwiegelung der Landarbeiter. Due to, his, to this event, I believe, Hedde lost his license to practice law and he decides to emigrate. In New York City, the German press gives him a warm welcome. He moves to Davenport, Iowa, where he finds friends, uh, among them also Theodor Olshausen, who is now the publisher of the German weekly The Democrat. Hedde owns a real estate business with von Schirach, and it is probably through this business that he becomes aware of a town building scheme in Nebraska, at a point where most likely the transcontinental railroads will come through. Since 1854, Nebraska is open for settlement, and in 1857, Hedde and a number of German, Germans settle in the region which is today Grand Island in Hall County. Again, political active, Hedde is elected to represent this area in the territorial legislature in Omaha. And it is uh, through these political activities that he becomes well known throughout Nebraska. 
That is here, Omaha in 1872, and you can see in the background already the bridge of the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, you know, it's uh, 1872, yeah, the railroad is completed. It's an interesting picture of the time when Hedde was there in the legislature. Nebraska becomes a state in 1867 with its capital in Omaha. The governor of this new state gave strong support for the organization of an immigration program. He believed that such a program would bring to our people a tenfold return in population and capital. He pointed out that so far Nebraska had been negligent in the subject. Other states had sent agents in every direction to divert a share of the westward tending stream of immigration from overpopulated country, end quote. It took the governor almost three years to convince the Nebraska legislature of the importance of such a program. In 1870, the legislature, in a special session, passed a law which would provide $15,000 to cover the cost for a state immigration agency for two years. It turned out soon that this was far too little money for such an undertaking, not only in Minnesota, but I guess Nebraska didn't have money for that either. Four immigration agents were appointed to perform their duties in this country or in foreign countries. And I might mention at that time, Nebraska had a population of about 120,000. This, of course, does not include the thousands and thousands of Indians who lived in that area. Well known as Hedder had become for his pol policies on economic growth and expansion in Nebraska, as the local paper mentioned, devoted to the interest of our state, his appointment as a state immigration agent for Germany did not come as a surprise. The newspaper, the Omaha Republican, in a lengthy article pointed out that Hedder belongs to the best educated classes of Germany and has there as well as here a high character for ability and integrity. He has all over Germany, and especially in Schleswig-Holstein, a great many old friends, all of whom have as lawyers, physicians, ministers, merchants, and farmers a high standing in their communities and will be of valuable assistance to everything he is undertaking. As a former editor and correspondent, he not uh, he had most likely still important connections to a number of leading newspapers in Germany. Another point one should not dismiss is Hedde had known Nebraska from the very beginning on, and by his own example, he could prove to prospective immigrants how one could succeed here in Nebraska. Um, this is the town I'm living in. This is from 1867. It's taken from the railroad. The railroad is parallel to that street you have here. And you can see uh, there is a saloon is the most prominent thing, which must be important, I guess. To the right is the telegraph office, 1867. And uh, railroad towns, as they are designed, have in front, when you arrive, always all the businesses, and that's Front Street. And then the main street goes, it has a T formation, that's what it's called. Uh, the the um, residential area goes then on, on the T, you can see that. Uh, in March of uh, 1871, a few months before he had left for Germany, the Grand Island newspaper published the following note. Hall County, the first in the state to organize a board of immigration, nothing like being always ahead. The local immigration board had been started by Grand Island bankers, merchants, and the editor of the local paper. There is no doubt in my mind that Fred, Fred Hedder was the driving force behind. He had published an article about the necessity to form local immigrant immigration boards and hoped so very much that Omaha, Lincoln, and other larger places uh, would soon do the same. He recommended that the local board should assist immigrants in any possible way and protect them from deception. Grand Island's board was quite active. For example, in a note in the Independent, which is our local newspaper, a letter of inquiry concerning this county addressed to Hall County Board of Immigration will be promptly answered, whether written in German, English, or Danish. So arriving immigrants could always find a place to stay. As a uh, the board proudly announced sleeping accommodation for 100 immigrant persons are now on the disposal of the whole county board of immigration. 
I should show you another photo. I don't know if you can see this. This is 1874, so between 1867 and 1874, that is the development you have of that town. It's uh, hard to imagine how to sell a place like that. Uh, I mean, the, the big draw was, of course, uh, the 160 acres which were promised with the, with the homestead law, but it started to develop. Um, uh, however, the principal function of the local immigration of the local organization was the gathering of dependable facts on farmland. The immigrant could obtain information on the quality and quantity and the price of land. In 1871, a map of Hall County drawn up by the board and published in every weekly issue of the Platte Valley Independent showed government and railroad lands still available, available to the prospective Settlers. On this map, you can see very well the railroad is kind of diagonal going through, and uh, to the right and uh, to the north and to the south, you have the uh, 20 miles which were promised by the government. The dark squares, these 640 acres, the dark, dark sections are um, uh, railroad land in uneven numbers, and the white ones are government land. The railroad land you could buy immediately, and uh, the government land you could homestead. Um, uh, Hedda arrived in Hamburg on the 23rd of June, 1871, only a few weeks after the Franco-Prussian Franco War had ended. And I want to show you this one here. This shows, uh, this is a figure of the German immigration. The straight line are the Euro, uh, United States figures, and Germany started to, after 70-71, after the war starts to produce this, gra this uh, graph. And you can see uh, the 55 or so, we had uh, immigration from Germany quite high, and then the Civil War is here. And after, the, uh, or during or after the Civil War, we have immigration, and then you have the war of 1870-71, again, where there is a dip. And uh, that is a time where Hedda is going over. So he predicts a large immigrant. He could not foresee that huge dip of the uh, depression which came in, eight, in the middle of the 1870s. Um, as Hedda so accurately reported, now at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, one could expect a steep rise in the number of immigrants, and as he mentioned, for years to come. As I said, he could not foresee at that point the uh, depression which followed. He thought that due to the new laws relating to military service and conscription for three years in the standing army, the fear of another war and heavy taxation, people would hurry to emigrate to America. Later, Hedder would observe that already in 1872, immigration from Hamburg had increased by 50%. Quote, this increase of immigration by 50% has alarmed the wealthier classes, especially the nobility and all such men who are holding large estate, as immigration to a certain degree deprives them of their labor and compels them to pay higher wages." End quote. And Hedde continues, the government of the German state and that of the German empire are certainly not favorable to immigration, and they are urged by the thoughtless German aristocracy to do something to prevent immigration. According to Hedda, the only thing the German government had done against immigration was to abolish the reduced fares system of the railroads and to increase the passage from German ports to the United States. Hedda was certain that stricter regulation would not follow. Quote, since Bismarck is smart enough to know that stopping emigration means favor favoring revolution, end quote. Sorry. Because, because newspapers in Germany were influenced by the government and supported by the nobility, they were unwilling to publish anything which would support emigration. This fact, and that Hedda had very little money to promote and advertise Nebraska, made it difficult for him to work. I found out that he spent more money of his own money on this venture than he received from the state of Nebraska. He had to look for newspapers who would print his articles free of charge, and he was seeking to help from 
uh, seeking the help from shipping lines who had all uh, had well established a well established net of agents throughout Germany. He was also seeking help from immigration agencies. One private immigration agency in Germany was the Humboldt Association with his own publication entitled Nature. The title is somewhat concealing uh, the promotional aspect of the publication by putting an emphasis on flora and fauna. By the way, had his article about Nebraska published in Nature would later build the basis for his small book Der Staat Nebraska, which came out in Kiel in 1874. The price was 10 Silbergroschen. Wait, I have a picture of that. There. Um, this book is not well known and has, to my knowledge, never been translated into English. I want to shortly talk about this book. Back in Nebraska in a letter in 1873 to the Nebraska governor, had pointed out that when in Germany he had received many inquiries asking for more detailed books on Nebraska as an immigration state, and that he intends to write such a book. He needed help in collecting data and asked for the assistance from the state and help from the cooperation from the some, uh, senators and representatives of Congress. This book contains countless facts on Nebraska, statistics about agriculture, the average yield of corn at that time was an optimistic 32 bushels an acre. Uh, compared to today, we have about 200 bushels an acre. A description of geology, uh, the geology of Nebraska transportation, explanation about United States political systems, a chapter on the Germans already in Nebraska, it's a wealth of information. And as Hedder pointed out to prospective German immigrants, it seemed inconceivable that one could get 160 acres of free land. In a chapter eight of this book, he explains extensively different land laws, especially he provides a detailed account on the homestead law. This book gives a perfect picture of Nebraska in the early 1870s. So back to Hedde in Germany. There is on the bottom an ad, the Agentur des Staates Nebraska, and it's signed by Frederick Hedde. The immigration board had insisted to print advertising material in Omaha in order to show what Nebraska can do. The material finally arrived nearly at the end of Hedde's stay in Germany, and as a result, he had been forced earlier to ask the Union Pacific and the Burlington, Missouri Railroad for advertising material, material he would then distribute by the thousands. This is here one from, uh, from the Union Pacific, and on the bottom you can see in Hall County there are still 125,000 acres available. It's a neat one. Um, let's see the next one. millions of acres in Iowa and Nebraska. Um, of course, the railroads were happy to find an outlet for their publications. Heather would distribute 14,000 ads for the Burlington alone. Of course, he suggested that pamphlets about Nebraska should be printed in Germany, a cheaper and faster process. Heather strongly recommended that Nebraska should also publish in Germany its own newspaper something other states had done. He suggested that Nebraska's press should send its newspapers to the agent working in Germany in order for him to have the latest information on hand. Railroads in America should be persuaded to provide cheaper tickets to Nebraska for arriving immigrants, and he wished that such tickets could be already sold in Germany. In Nebraska, he suggested uh, that immigrant homes should be established for the arriving immigrant, free of charge. And the Burlington, Missouri Railroad Company would set up such a building, just such a building in Lincoln that year. Of course, in the beginning, everybody could see the benefit for the state with such a program. Despite that the number of immigrants to Nebraska had increased, the immigration board taking all the credit for this increase, the claim by the board cannot be proven. The funds, the $15,000 Nebraska legislature had provided, was spent in less than six months. 
Agents in Europe, like Hedde, received only a small part of their salary. Newspapers in Nebraska started to question the whole program. Beginning in 1873, the Falls City Journal wrote, the whole thing is a contemptible humbug, a swindle on the state. The Platte Valley Independent in Grand Island, which had been so optimistic and eager in the support of such venture, wrote now, in Hull County, we have yet to meet the first individual who will acknowledge that he was brought here through, my, through any efforts made by the board, while we find that fully half of the new settlers readily admit that they were induced to come to this country through the instrumentality of the independent. Well, puff in those days was the bread and butter for the newspapers. Money shortage and complaints, for example, the board had stopped the program six months earlier than planned without informing Hedde of this fact who was then stranded in Germany, forced the Nebraska legislature to call for an investigation. And Hedde, on his return, prepared an interesting lengthy statement. This in investigation would show that the Burlington, Missouri Railroad had spent $500,000 on foreign immigration and the Union Pacific 300,000. Both railroads had benefited as well as the state of Nebraska. The recommendation was that the state should continue its own activity, but with a much larger budget. The Board of Immigration, the Nebraska Board of Immigration reorganized, but soon had to fold. The different railroads at that point continued the efforts of immigration promotion for Nebraska. I would like to uh, make a few remarks on head of later, his later activities. They are interesting. By the 1880s, Grand Island had outgrown the character of a frontier town. A decade before, the Union Pacific had been the magnetic force behind the settlement of this area. It had diligently supported the town and also propped up the local newspaper. The Union Pacific had, for example, donated a piece of land to the Leader Grand Society in order to build a hall, a sort of civic center, we would say today. Open to everybody, this place was used for entertainment, political rallies, and meetings. The towns, people, and the farmers were in the beginning dependent on the railroad for survival and for economic growth. But now, in the early 1880s, the local newspaper reflected politics and its impact on the economy of this region, and it strongly criticized the Union Pacific for the monopoly on freight rates in this area. The farmer who had seen the railroad as a benefactor now realized that the Union Pacific took advantage of him. It is at this point that Fred Hedder started the weekly paper, The Anti-Monopolist, a unique paper for Nebraska. I might mention that the paper on the beginning contained also articles in German. This was not the case. Hedder's whole newspaper, he later has the local paper, he never wrote in German, unlike so many 48ers who started German newspapers. The reason probably is that Hedder and uh, the Independent were Republican, and the German press we had in Grand Island was um, uh, democratic. And so I assume and he, he spoke English long before he came to America. Um, so this is, the, this is the German, he wrote on the beginning a few articles in German, but later wrote the ones in, in English. Had I mentioned that the paper principal function was to combat the railroad monopolies. He thought that it was high time to revive again the old principles of free democracy and republicanism. The anti-monopolist can be considered a local paper variant of the national movement. Shortly afterwards, Hedder would acquire the Platte Valley Independent, merging it with the Anti-Monopolist and now renaming it the Grand Island Independent. Uh, that's a newspaper we still have today after 140 years. Grand Island Independent has a big little, a little note on the bottom or on the, on the front page, which says we are 140, 43 years in the business now. The Anti-Monopolist, uh, only short-lived, deserves to be brought to the attention of historians. And then another little sideline uh, about Hedder, which shows something about his character. Another more curious item was a correspondence, better said, a battle between a suffragette from Omaha, Harriet Brooks, and Fred Hedder in 1881. 
It was published in the Grand Island Times. It was another English paper in Grand Island. He writes articles titled The Equality of Sexes, and I think he means that a little sarcastically. There he insisted that women don't have the mental capacity to understand the world as it is. In his mind, women should stick, it's, I'm sorry, there he is. Um, in his mind, women should stick to the KKK, Kirche, Küche und Kinder. This, of course, has all taken place in the background of a Nebraska vote in 1882 for an amendment which would have given women full suffrage. It's a lot of fun to read this correspondence between the two, and it throws another light on Hedda. Um, here, this is Grand Island in about 1910. He died in 1908, and you can see the biggest building in town is a building here on the left side, and uh, this is a header building. He uh, made money, obviously. He was successful, and he built that building in the, in the basement. There was a newspaper he was running. It's from 1886, that building. So this is about 1910. And then in the first floor, we had doctor's offices, a dentist, and lawyers, and then on top is where he lived. This, head, this building is still standing. Uh, another fact might be interesting to you. We talk a lot about uh, the Lincoln Highway going from New York City to San Francisco. It went right down the street here in Grand Island. You see some cars there. And so anyway, thank you. that. <coughs> it's okay. <laughs> go. Okay, next paper is supposed to be Gabriel, Gabriele Robinson. Uh, Dr. Robinson is, was, I should say, professor of English at University of uh, Illinois for a while and then also at Indiana University South Band. She has received a number of awards in her career, wrote six books, and I didn't even dare to count the number of articles that filled an entire page. So she was a very pro, a, a very active um, English teacher and English scholar. Her paper is entitled Epistol, epistolary snapshot of an eight, of eight, of 48er physician Christian Sack in Bavarian Indiana. Now, I just got the paper about 20 minutes ago. I did not have a chance to actually read it before I read it now. So, if I stutter a few times, my apologies and it's a start. <clears throat> Quote. Decisions that influence the course of history arise out of the individual's experience of thousands or millions of individuals, end quote. That is what journalist Sebastian Hafner wrote when he decided to put together his memoir, Defying Hitler. He added that, quote, by retelling my private, unimportant story, I am adding an important, unrecognized facet to contemporary German and European history more significant and more important for the future than if I were to disclose who set fire to the Reichstag, end quote. What Havner says about the importance of one man's experience during the Third Reich applies no less to any period. Insight into the, individuals of, into the lives of individuals contributes striking details and complexity to our historical understanding. Letters have or always been one direct, intimate way to provide such insight. I am basing my remarks on a 19th century correspondence between Artsburg in Upper Franconia and South Bend, Indiana. What makes this correspondence particularly useful is that it deals with one man and his family and friends over a period of 30 years and with people who were educated and literate thanks to a lucky accident of history. Many of, these, of the letters are, cons are consecutive so that a coherent story emerges. Moreover, since much is known about the lives and backgrounds of these writers, it is easy to put together 
put their words into perspective and assess their significance. At the center of, their, of this correspondence stands Christian Sack who came, to, came across as a typical 48er, self-assured and outspoken, even arrogant on occasions, but with an unshakable commitment to freedom and equality and social justice. Christian was born in Arzberg on December 20, 1820. His father was a master butcher and member of the city council. His mother also came from a good family with a brother, a professor of mathematics in Vienna. However, Christian, the, the tenth of 16 children, five of whom died, was their only child to attend university. After graduating from gymnasium at Hof, about 30 miles from Arzburg, Christian went to the University of Erlangen in 1841 on a scholarship to study theology. He joined the Budenröser fraternity, making contact, contacts that helped him to become active in the 48er movement. 42 letters to and from Christian Sack have survived from the 1840s. In general, to our ears, the letters sound re rather effu effusive, speaking of male friendships in, in floral language, expressing vehement disappointment at not having heard from Sack or making long-winded excuses for not having written. But they are also full of amusement, amusing vignettes of student life, focused as much on drinking and partying as on academic affairs. Quote, we are everywhere where there is something going on, but it's it near or far, and everywhere we think we can find beautiful girls. But the, girl, the young girls also come cause us worry. Just look at Pfeiffer, for I always fear for his pants, which get too tight for him as soon as he sees a certain girl, how easily they could rip. Wow, did I really agree to read this? <laughs> After finishing his theology course in 1844, Suck did not move to a, onto a career as Vika, but instead became per preceptor to the children of Mr. von Glass, a wealthy industrialist in Wollashammer, just outside Arzberg. While there, he realized that he was not suited to be to the religious calling. No doubt the conservative stance of the church played a role in Sack's abandoning, of, abandoning this calling before he could ever took it up. He now wanted to become a physician. From Borla's house, Sack kept up a lively correspondence with his fraternity brothers, which focused, focuses on the political and social upheavals of that time. He did, not, did more than write letters for Sack's name, was included on the list of promoters against the throne and the government. One of the longest, longest 1848 letters to Sack has no signature, since the last page or pages are missing, and I could not find any other letters in this handwriting. One likely author is Heinrich Gerpart, a gymnasium professor in Hof, where Sack had been a student. He was a member of the Frankfurt National Assembly and also of, quote, the committee of the local homeland association whose, ta whose task it is to gain recognition for a lawful democracy, end quote. The letter is dated October 18, 1848, and begins with a compliment to Sack's work. Quote, I was delighted to see from your last letter that I'm still dealing with the same true soul who has the people's interest at heart. I, too, can assure you that I will contribute my bid as much as it is within my power. Many drops make a stream, and therefore we should never <clears throat> oops, sorry, we should never tire out of our work, even if right now it seems as if the old card of state once again is getting stuck in the old Morris end quote. Then he comes to his scene. Quote, briefly stated, I want a democracy in the widest form and norms as, benefiting, as benefits the conditions of the time. I do not care whether out of this comes an inherent monarchy or which present, presently there is not much to be hoped, or an elected monarch, elective monarchy, or a republic with a presidium 
as long as the executive of the highest power of the state comes from the people. I, for my part, want freedom above all, which must naturally be followed by unity. From the latter, one can follow how the 48er's passion for freedom and equality gradually is undermined by intimate intimation of failure. The forces against them were just too powerful. A long and emotional letter of November 11, 1848 shows this disillusionment. The writer signed himself only as Johann and called Sack his dearest friend, to whom alone he can open his heart. Quote, when during the course of this year I got news of the grand uprising in all parts of Germany, I thanked the law, Lord, and I could witness such a wonderful day and wouldn't have minded to be laid in my tomb that very moment. But, I have, but how de deceived was I and thousands with me? Already on August 6, the day on which the Central War Ministry was too cowardly to enforce its decrees concerning the oaths on the flag, from this day on I began to doubt. Oh, if only then a determined step had been taken. Those creatures that opposed liberty and would, li would lie destroy at our feet, and so much dear German blood could have been saved in the fight against those com contemptible forces who wanted to, s want to, s to lead us back to those egos egotistical court policies that have subjugated Germany for so many years. Yet influential 48ers weren't given up that easily. This is clear from a letter of Dr. Gustav Blumenreuter, a physician in Griechen Lamnitz and an 1848 delegate to the Frankfurt National Assembly. The letter dated May, 8, May 16, 1849, thanks Sachs for collecting 14 gulden, six kreuzer, in support of the political prisoners of Freiburg. Then he lashes out, quote, it is high time that everybody stands ready, armed for battle, for the red monarchy, damned Prussia in the lead, are carrying on in too beastly and shameless a manner. They will not win if we all continue to fight bravely, and it's going to be a long fight, End quote. On December 9, 1849, Pumphardt, Another friend expressed disillusionment even among his fraternity brothers. According to a letter I just received, there has been a decisive change at the Bubenreuser where the free thinking section has pushed out the reactionaries. So now they have again one old mock. All this time, Suck did not give up his dream of becoming a doctor. He asked friends for money or free board and professors to forego the honorarium. By 1852, he finally had scrapped together enough to enroll at the University of Würzburg, a highly regarded medical school. The renowned Dr. U Rudolf Virchow, followed a uh, founder of cellular pathology, taught there between 1849 and 1856. Virchow was a prominent 48er, and Sack must have absorbed not only medical but social lessons from him. Especially after 1849, Sack often considered to immigrate to the United States. His friends, however, disapproved, telling him that he shouldn't flee from the challenge of helping his own country. Anyway, as one of them wrote, America, quote, is not a country for people of taste and education. Nevertheless, this disillusionment in the years after 1848 was too great and the hope of a better life too powerful. So when an esteemed older Augsburg friend wrote to Sack from South Bend on 18, April 8, 1855, about the opportunity for a doctor in the small community, Sack's decision was made. He hired on as a ship's doctor and sailed from Le Havre in May 1855, bound for South Bend, Indiana. Yet his friends did not forgive his abandoning them. Even 15 years later, in 1861, a friend writes to him that his departure still is criticized bitterly. Sack not only brought with him his training, and even as he had been advised, medical supplies, 
but also his hatred of humbug and clericalism, as well as his love of music and faith in education. Almost from the moment he arrived, he helped to inaugurate the first choral society in South Bend. He also became a prominent member of the Turners, where he served as fencing master and director of the Turner Dramatic Society. Soon after arriving in South Bend, while his German girlfriend still hoped for his return, Christian Sack married Katharina Koenig, who in 1849, at the age of 16, had followed her, her father to South Bend, making the long journey by, all by herself. Letters to his nephew Andreas show Sack as a loyal 48er. He ab admonished the careless, you, the careless young man. Sack often lost patience with Andreas, who would not settle down to a steady job, wanting to do nothing but play his violin. <clears throat> Sack immigrated in, a, in large part because he hated conditions in Germany. After the failures, failure of, 18, of the 1848 revolution, yet 10 years later, he sings but fa back fondly to the beautiful year of 1848. But then he reminds himself, quote, with what kind of fearfulness political question used to be discussed. With what kind of restraint one got into such discussion? How one first asked oneself fearfully whether one had, not after all uttered, something unwelcome, or even high treason, for which one would earn such censure. By contrast, America appears in a clear light. He admitted that there are some noticeable afflictions in this young state caught up in its development. We have to suffer much unpleasant, unpleasantness through insufficient and inappropriate laws and are in some respects humbugged and swindled. Yet, these are nothing but small matters when set against the sweet and unrestricted enjoyment of free speech and freedom. A little more than 10 years after the failure of 1848, uh, the political landscape in Germany seemed to have improved. Writing on March 24, 1861, Johann Schweigert, one of Sachs' best friends and fellow 48ers, sees, new, sees hope for a new Germany. Looking back, judges the spirit of, eight, of 48 harshly. But by then, Sack was not tempted to return. He had made a solid career for himself in South Bend. He was closely linked to the many German immigrants who had come from Artsburg and made their fortunes there. In fact, one part of town was called Little Artsburg. Another goose pasture, because the Germans, Sack concluded, all kept geese. Like most of the German immigrants of that period, Sack struck a balance between his loyalty to both his birth country and his new base, new home. His biculturalism is symbolized in the banner of the South Bend Tornify, which he created in 1867. It displays the stars and stripes on one side and the Tornify emblem on the other. Suck was active in both the German and the larger community. In 1875, he was instrumental in, the, in reorganizing this the St. Joseph County Medical Society, where he served as second vice president. And under the leadership of the German immigrants, the grow growing city's cultural, culture, music, and entertainment were thriving with famous, New Year's with famous New Year balls at Turner Hall, moonlight picnics, parades with music from the Turner Band, masquerades and plays. In this way, the Turner's not only celebrated German culture, but helped to forge a link between themselves and the native-born who eagerly participated in Turner events. Samuel Litwing, editor of several German, U.S. German language newspapers, observed the 4th of July, 1865, in South Bend, admiring the speeches and the spirited brass band of the Turners. Without them, it would not have been a quiet and it would have been a quiet and desolate in the town as in the streets of Pompeii. The coldest 4th of July 
with a thermometer at 98 degrees Fahrenheit that I had experienced in 28 years. More than 150 years later, with bond, this bond between Artsburg and South Bend was reestablished with a sister city relationship. Sack died on April 12, 1889, an indication that he gained repute in both the German and the English-speaking community is that, is that funeral or, or eulogy, eulogies were given by Georg Geier, prominent Turner, and the Honorable A.L. Brick, a native-born prosecuting attorney of the St. Joseph County Circuit Court. Sack's influence reaches into the next generation. Two of his three daughters, Ross and Tekla, became prominent school teachers in South Bend. Rosa, Rosa teaching music and Tekler German. They continued their father's love of German language and culture. Tekler in particular was a strong supporter of Turner activities and member of music study of the Music Study Club and the Progress Club. She had been ex educated at Berkeley Middle College in Vermont and the University of Chicago. The sisters who remained single lived together until both died until their deaths in 1943. Forty-eighters like Sack helped to create in the new world the free and, cultural, and cultured society they had longed for in the old. It was after their arrival that German clubs and cultural organizations blossomed in South Bend and throughout the U.S. But these 48ers also maintained their outspoken and sometimes arrogant attitude which brought them into conflict, which conservative Germans Germans and Americans alike, who saw in their radicalism a threat to religion and American institutions. Above all, however, the 48ers were an invigorating force in the new and rapidly growing country. Quote, no immigrant group before or after them manifested the enthusiasm and the spirit of these erstwhile revolutionaries, and no group left such a deep impression upon German-American culture. Like a stone, a stone thrown into still water, the 48ers produced waves in the German-American pool high enough eventually to affect the entire American cultural pattern." End quote. Thank you. And <clears throat> Going? Yes. Uh -huh. And with that, we turn over to Jan Jensen, who has one of the longest journeys to come up here. Just <laughs> technology sometimes is difficult. He comes to us from Flensburg, and he has been working in that area for a while now. He has been a um, member of the Danish minority in southern Schleswig. He had studied at the University of Odense and Salzburg. Quite a change there in scenery. Um, he has worked at the Danish Folklore Archives in Copenhagen, and he also worked as a teacher present. Presentation. There oh, we go. Thank you. Close to. Uh, he has taught at the University of Southern Denmark and also in various um, adult education centers. Uh, he has led groups on study trips and he is currently in charge of the Schleswig collection at the Danish Central Library of Schleswig Holstein in Flensburg. And supposedly has his family with him, but he has refused to bring them along to the event today, unfortunately. The and code, please. <laughs> Sorry. Supposedly, my talk was supposed to last long enough for him to set up. What's that? But, um, uh, station. Station. Not presentation. Station. Okay. Thank you for this presentation. And the code is not presentation, but station. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, Schleswig collection of which I'm in charge of. Um, 
I could have made a whole conference just on the history of the Schleswig collection. Um, I'll do that next year here. Um, until then, I will kindly ask you to read the brochure. I'll pass this around. Thank you. Um, just one and a half year ago, uh, approximately one and a half year ago, I was sitting in, at the desk in my office and I turned around to pick something up, to pick something up which came out of the printer, and suddenly two strangers are standing behind my chair. And uh, these two people turn out to be Yogi Repmann and Klaus Lemke. Um, so you can imagine what kind of shock that was. Um, but uh, quite quickly, we agreed upon uh, me being here today. So that's one and a half year ago. I thank you for your courage, for encouraging me to get here today. That's great. Um, this conference, which is focusing a lot on certain individuals which have immigrated to the United States, I think also it is very important to have a, a side glance on the other side of the coin, so to speak, um, on, the, um, on the effect this immigration had on the regions being left behind. When thousands of people leave a relatively What have you done to my PC or to your PC? Oh, I'm talking too much, that's why. No, no, no. Where is the expert? Please come down once again. I won't say a word until this works. Nobody wants to come? She's coming? Okay. <gasps> it worked. Uh, wait, wait. You, you never know. You never know. You never know. I'm sorry. Station didn't work either. But why are you doing this? When thousands of people leave a relatively smaller region, this has an inevitable effect on those who are left behind and on the depleted region being left. The immigrants were often energetic younger people of initiative. In fact, it was this kind of people the Schleswig region sorely needed in the years of restoration following the Schleswig Wars. This lecture about those who were left behind examines the consequences the immigrations of thousands had on those Schleswigers who choose to stay in Schleswig, those who stayed in their homeland in spite of the Danish victory of 1851, and later those who did not leave in spite of Danish defeat and the Prussian seizure of power after the 1864 war. Even the experts can do this. Great. Um, there is only relatively little statistic data on immigration available, but by combining the existing and available information, one must assume that in the course of the 19th century, what's the solution? It should be going now. Okay, great. Well. One must assume that in the course of the 19th century, at least 100,000 people left Schleswig. But still, the total population grew considerably in the last decades of the century, so that at the end of the 1800s, there are actually more people living in Schleswig than at the beginning of the century. So, excuse me for a second. I take this very easy. These apparently contradictory trends reveal a marked change of the composition of the population of the Duchies in the decades after the Schleswig Wars. Especially,
especially the decades between 1870 and 1890 were decades of change. From approximately 1870, the Duchies develop into an important region of immigration, especially to the United States. Danish-minded priests and teachers who would not pay allegiance to the Prussian king were dismissed. For the same reason, many conscripted young men immigrated from Schleswig. Especially in the 1870s, the Danish movement experienced serious blows. In the local elections, the Danish minority, oh, sorry, Danish majority was lost. In Flensburg and Omeron, this happened in 1871. In Helsley in 1877, and in Singapore in 1878. The exception was the town of Turner, which always had a vast German majority. Thus, the traditionally Danish-minded populations in the north and in the west of Schleswig lost many Danish voters due to immigration. One more break. Let's see how this works now. I planned this, this is just to make it more exciting. Here we go. A sure sign of a more conscious Germanizing policy was the law in 1876 that prescribed that German should be the only language allowed in public administration. This resulted in a discharge of official staff. These were replaced by Prussians, many of whom were immigrants to Schleswig from other parts of Prussia or elsewhere in the German Confederation. But there are many indications, however, that most of the immigrants did not, leave, did not leave Schleswig for national reasons or because they were more or less revolutionary minded 48ers. Apparently, most immigrants were unskilled agricultural workers and farm hands. But in the same period, Schleswig Holstein also becomes a country of immigration to the, to the area due to factors that led to growth and structural change, to mention a few examples, a development of railway network, construction of the Kiel Canal, and establishment of many brickworks. Modernizations also changed agricultural production and tradition and eventually led to an industrialization of farm work. These technical in innovations and the modernization of agricultural production made migration to Schleswig necessary due to shortage of labor, in part because a lot of people, especially farm workers and laborers, had immigrated partly because these innovations simply uh, required a lot of extra manpower. Thus, labor and working condition changed fundamentally in this period. The emerging labor shortages naturally resulted in a greater demand for manpower, which in turn led to a markedly increase of salaries, especially in the rural area. Also in the late 1800s, an ever-increasing number of seasonal workers sought and found labor in Schleswig, in part to replace those who had immigrated. These seasonal workers were both from other parts of the German Confederation, especially from Mecklenburg and Pomerania, and from abroad also, particularly from Poland and Sweden. Many of those who came to work in Schleswig, however, came to stay. This gradually reduced the amount of seasonal workers and eventually turned this seasonal migration into a permanent settlement in Schleswig. The demand for manpower due to immigration in industrialization also increased the mobility of many workers, as many workers changed employers according to needs and wage demands. 
This led to a breakdown of the traditional manorial system, which at its core was based upon the workers' permanent or even lifelong settlement and working relation with the manor and its lord. The new rural urban migrations were also motivated by the workers' needs, since many workers returned to the countryside after a short period of city work when there was, agricult when there was agricultural work for them, for example, in harvest season. Most popular towns for rural urban migrations were the city of Flensburg, Kiel, and Hamburg. Though Kiel and Hamburg were outside of Schleswig, more than 30% of the Schleswigers lived in towns in 1910, while less than 20% did so in 1860. Farm laborers who did not immigrate but moved to town instead had to find their place in a new social structure. On top of the city's social pyramids, they found industrial entrepreneurs, shipping magnates, and wealthy merchants. In the town of Schleswig, many administrative leaders were to be found, too. In some smaller towns, the situation was a bit different, as master craftsmen could mingle with the upper classes here, which also consisted of academics like lawyers and doctors. But this social structure changed with industrialization, immigration, and migration from the countryside to the towns. The old bourgeoisie, as we have heard yesterday also, or was it today? I can't remember. It was today. The old bourgeoisie, the old bourgeoisie was gradually reduced as the new middle class and, work and, and working class grew steadily. Especially the number of unskilled laborers was growing rapidly. The new classes also changed the image of the towns, as we can see it by housing projects such as Flensburg's Tospistrasse, with stylish flats and tasteful buildings for the new middle class. And when you drive down this road and turn left, you come to the Schleswig Collection, by the way. Um, also in Flensburg, Germany's first cooperative housing corporation was established in 1878, the Flensburger Arbeiter Bauverein, which wants to secure cheap housing for the new working classes of skilled and unskilled labor, which moved from the country into the growing cities. This concept was soon to be copied, first in the town of Hellerslö, we see it somewhere here, and eventually in other towns of Schleswig. As mentioned earlier, a greater demand for manpower led to a markedly increase of salaries in the rural area, especially as many workers changed employers according to needs and wage demands. Thus, lower social classes developed a real class consciousness, which was used to make demands for landlords, especially wage demands. This was a new historical experience, as a situation like this would have been unthinkable before the Schleswig Wars and the waves of immigration. In addition to these economic conditions, this new consciousness and this new historical experience also changed rural life, which increasingly became urbanized, influenced by the city life returned sons and daughters had experienced. Thus, one of the primary effects of migration was a change of mentality. Opposition to the ancient manorial system grew, and the discussion of employment conditions and wages was made possible, not at least because the three sectors of industry, railway, and agriculture competed for wages and the much sought-after manpower. And now I'm getting the serious glasses on. Ah, oh, yeah. All these allegations so far may sound like a success story, but they are disguising the fact that Schleswig also developed a strong social imbalance in the decades after 64. In 1864, Schleswig lost its role as a bridge between Danish and German-dominated parts of the Danish Empire. 
Instead, Schleswig became the new Germany's northernmost and remote fringe. Schleswig thus lost its position as an intermediary between economically adva advantaged Holstein and the less developed Danish kingdom. While the aforementioned economic improvement especially was a great benefit for Holstein and the southern part of Schleswig, central and northern Schleswig lost its economic foothold. The only exception to this trend was Flensburg. The city's economic growth, mainly based on trade, shipping, and industry, continued, mainly based on the aforementioned rural urban migrations. Thus, immigration and the broken connection to Denmark interrupted decades of economic patterns and trade traditions. Two examples to this development in northern and western Schleswig may serve as cases, Langenhorn and Skerbeck. This is Langenhorn. There isn't much to see, and there's a reason to it. Langenhorn is a small village in the west of Schleswig, the northern part of northern Frisia, to prove that there is actually something there. I used the magnifier. There it comes. Langen Langenhorn. After the war of 1864, the village had a relatively high number of inhabitants with approximately 1,900 people living in the village area after a period with a high birth rate. After the war, the economic development which, which benefited southern Schleswig did not affect Langenhorn. This had a dramatic effect. 600 persons immigrated to the USA. 13 persons immigrated to Australia. 20 people immigrated to other European cities, Hamburg, Copenhagen, and the booming towns of the Ruhr district in central Germany. In spite of the immigration of approximately 650 persons in the period immediately after the 1864 war, Langenhorn still wasn't economically sustainable. The uh, positive economic development elsewhere did not materialize in Langenhorn, and once again, another 200 people left their hometown. The depletion through immigration of northern and western Schleswig called for replacement. Thus, the Ansiedlungsverein of Western, sorry, Ansiedlungsverein fürs westliche Nordschleswig, translated as the Settlement Association of Western North Schleswig, was founded in Röding at the Kongo River in the in northernmost Schleswig. I took this picture for you last week, two weeks ago. The purpose of this association was to attract German farmers to the remote borderland between Schleswig and Denmark, where many had immigrated. A similar project was established in the Skabeck area on the west coast of northern Schleswig, which also had been heavily depleted by immigration, which this picture might show or prove. Gebeck. To give you an impression of the very severe situation in the Skerbeck region, I have translated Peter Skorroy's Old People's Town from Danish, and Danish is called Die Gamles Bü for you. Peter Skorroy was the editor of the Danish newspaper of Tunner, where this text was originally published in 1898. It was reissued in the same year in the yearbook of the Danish Linguistic Association, Sprofereinings Elmanak, in Danish, here it comes. The text describes a ride with a horse-drawn carriage in the Skabeck region. The two persons in the text are Mr. Skolroy himself and his friend, the local physician. Quote, my friend the doctor and I drove across the hilltop, and in front of us a wide plain lay before us, its smooth carpet of meadows resplendent in its green swelling summer lushness in the glow of the midday sun. 
I've been looking forward to read the sentence to you. Sorry. Every now and then, the shadow of a cloud glided across the friendly landscape and disappeared down there in the dark meadow valley like a black giant pot. What's the name of that town? I said, and pointed down across the meadow where a, line, where a line of small houses lay dotted along the narrow road which wound like a gray ribbon through the meadows. That isn't a town, the doctor said. It's only a tiny settlement. By the way, I have christened it. I call it Old People's Town. Why? Because there are a lot of old people living there. There are five houses, and in those five houses, there isn't a single person younger than 70. That's a quiet place, I can tell. He added after a little pause in a sad tone of voice. You don't hear youthful laughter or the cry of babies from those houses. I am tempted to believe there hasn't even been a smile there for many years. On the other hand, many teardrops have fallen there, and many a sad sigh has been heard in the dark alcoves. All year through, I have a patient there, sometimes even a few. But how can it be that there are only old people? Have all children died, or are all families childless? No, they are abandoned. This last word came harshly, almost sharply, from my friend's lips, and he whipped the horse in a way as if this whipping was about something quite different than the horse. And now the doctor toad with a voice vibrating with anger about the families in those five houses, how all of their children had immigrated either to the kingdom or to America. End of quote. Later in the conversation, the doctor stresses that from these only five houses, at least 17 people had immigrated within the last few years. The immigration had also advantages for Schleswig. The numbers of poor people were rapidly declining, simply because many poorer people left the area. Likewise, the importance of the poor houses was diminishing in the late 1800s. The Lloyd area north from Hennesloe, traditionally a poor area which had its own poor house built in 1857, might serve as an example. In 1873, more than 30% of the population was to, be, was to be considered poor here. In 1896, that figure had dropped to 25%, and in 1913, even to only 12% of the population. In 1882, still 25 persons lived in the Lloyd Poor House. Ten years later, there were only five. A positive development due to a combination of immigration and a general recovery of the economy. To sum things up, I would say that assumedly more than 100,000 people left the Duchy of Schleswig during the 19th century but still the population grew, especially the period of 1870 to 1890 are decades of change. Many public employees were displeased with the Prussian demands for German language, which, re which resulted in some immigration. But many immigrants were particularly skilled or unskilled agricultural workers who immigrated for economical or other reasons, maybe combined with national motives. But in the same period, Schleswig also turns into an area of immigration into the region, caused by factors which promoted economical growth and structural change. These innovations also changed and in industrialized farming, which led to a merging of urban industries and the agricultural sector into a mutual symbiosis. Also to replace immigrated manpower, employees made use of seasonal workers which led to a regional which led to regional immigration migrations once again, which led to regional migrations from east to west, for example from Mecklenburg and Pomerania into Schleswig. Workers became a much sought for commodity and the existing social underclass developed a real class consciousness.
One of the primary effects of migration is thus a change of mentality, which, among other things, enabled a discussion of working conditions and wages. The positive development in some areas of the Duchy should not conceal the stagnation in the middle of North Schleswig. Here, immigration and the broken connection to Denmark interrupted decades of economic patterns and trade traditions, as the examples of Langenhorn and Skabek illustrated. Thus, immigration out of Schleswig and immigration into the region changed the traditional work culture. It transformed both production methods and people's mentality. Not just in the country the immigrants traveled to, but also in the country they left behind. Thank you very much for your patience. Good. So we have about 25 minutes for questions, and I guess I will invite both of the presenters to take a chair, and I'll leave microphone two with them and come around with the other one to take your questions. Anyone? Anyone wants to go first? There we go. Uh, Jens, uh, I'm interested in your last uh, list of summaries. With the desire for workers, in a sense, was there any uh, obvious applications of technology? I'm thinking about America in 2013, um, with a decline in people having jobs. Was there any new uh, machinery? Uh, New machinery, technology, uh, applications in Jutland? Uh. Yes, there was, as I mentioned very early in my paper. Um, lots of the old brickworks were modernized. You know, they were mechanic, you know, there were a lot of mechanical improvements uh, being done there. The uh, Kiel Canal was, uh, was built in this period, which also resulted in a long series of um, technological innovations and, um, and also in the, in the uh, agricultural field, a lot of modernization took place in this period. So yes, this was a very, it was a period also of uh, technological upheaval. Absolutely so, mm -hmm. yes. Anyone else? 